Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jennifer Phillips Russo, Viticulture Extension Specialist with the Lake Erie Regional Grape Program. I'm here with Kevin Martin from Penn State University, and our special guest today is Dr. Terry Bates, who is the director at the Cornell Lake Erie Research and Extension Laboratory. And we are here to talk about Dr. Bates' research with mechanical pruning in sort of lieu of the labor situation that we've noticed around the belt this year. Thank you for joining us, Terry. Thanks for having me here. Kevin, do you have anything you want to add in regards to the labor situation and what we've heard? Yeah, I mean, I think what we're going to talk about just in terms of mechanical pruning and improvements being made in how we mechanically prune or research sort of revealing best practices for mechanically pruning is just timely because we are seeing a pretty critical labor shortage in general. Um, so obviously that severely impacts pruning and other things, but um, pruning for sure. So, so this is rather timely. Terry, I guess we'll throw yeah. it off into why, how, how and why. So, start yeah, so, <laughs> ugh, I, yeah, so I've been involved with mechanical pruning and, and other mechanical operations in the vineyard for, yeah, like 20 years now. And when I started at Cornell, like I had no, that was just not even in my wheelhouse. <laughs> uh, it, you know, my background is in plant nutrition and root biology and, and the whole mechanization thing was, it was pretty obvious um, that the labor issues were not going to go away, even back in the late 1990s. <laughs> uh, and I, we were just saying, you know, I, I feel like they've kind of ebbed in flow over the years. Like we start to have a real labor issue and everyone's interested in mechanization. And then, you know, the market gets a little better, labor becomes a little bit more available and all kind of goes to the wayside. And then a couple of years go by and it starts to get worse. I don't think it ever gets better it just kind of is this downward, it gets a little worse. Um, and maybe we're not at, at the lowest point yet, but it's headed in that direction, right? We just, it's quantity of labor, it's quality of labor. Um, you know, people don't want to do that kind of work. <laughs> Who wants to be out in the middle of February pruning grapevines? Yeah, I mean, I think part of the labor issue is, is a market issue, right? So that's the part that's hard to predict that ebbs and flows a little bit. Um, but we have some legislation, particularly in New York, but also federal legislation that makes it pretty easy to predict that things should get worse over the next two years. So um, if you're making business planning decisions, we can see sort of the writing on the wall that pruning should cost around 50 to 55 cents by 2025. Um, and that's just assuming that the market for labor stays the same, which it could get worse. Uh, so. So all things being equal, we should be at around 50 or 55 cents, uh, which I think allows growers some flexibility in terms of maybe purchasing equipment, changing practices, or thinking about H2A or investigating what Terry's doing and, and maybe starting to do some of that themselves. Which we have seen actually in the industry this year, we've had people borrowing other people's pruners to just help get through some of their acreage because they didn't have labor there. Yeah, can you see my screen? Yes, Terry. Yeah, screen. so yeah, um, so just to give you the idea that this has been around for a really long time, uh, the whole idea of that there's going to be labor issues and mechanical pruning is one way of, you know, getting over some of those issues. You know, Nelson Shala started working on mechanical pruning back in the 1970s, and so our vine management was a little bit different, right? We had, um, you know. We'd be hand pruning, downward shoot positioning. Um, so Nelson had this, this triangular <laughs> cutter bar arrangement where he was retaining all fruiting buds below the wire because they were shoot positioning to try to get sun exposure to those buds. So they called it lower 180 pruning. You know, Nelson did some work on it. He didn't really like it, you know, because of the bud quantity and quality issues. He felt like it would never surpass, you know, uh, what somebody could do pruning by hand. Um, and then when the market really kind of started to go in the 80s and the early 90s, there, Bob Poole introduced uh, minimal pruning or hedge pruning. And it was something that they were experimenting with in Australia and having some success 
with. But again, their climate is much different than New York. Longer growing season, more sunlight. They irrigate their vineyards. A little bit different than us. And so some of those, that minimal pruning, especially, and then some hedge pruning, got into an alternate bearing situation. They called it Miller Rondage. Um, and you needed to do other management to control crop. So that's where the whole crop estimation and mid-season fruit thinning came up, right? You leave all these buds with a box hedge and then you have to do something about it. So you could thin it off in the middle of the season. Um, so the idea was you were saving a lot in labor, but your management didn't taper, right? There had to be actually more management involved with trying to control the crop. And that's where um, uh, Justin Morris out of Arkansas, we were following what he, so this is kind of where I came on the scene. Um, I got involved with Justin Morris and he had this uh, system, he would call it the total vineyard mechanization system where it was mechanical pruning, uh, mechanical shoot thinning, mechanical uh, shoot positioning, uh, fruit thinning. So it was kind of like you put all these mechanical things together to try to make sure that you managed your crop size. Um, so there's some different, again, the Arkansas system for Concord really called for downward, again, it was more of a lower 180 pruning. And we were like, man, we're retaining all these like shade buds now, which aren't, they're not as good. <laughs> they're not as fruitful. Um, so that's when we started getting into these systems where we were pulling sun canes up. So essentially we started off with the bets where we took the Arkansas machine and flipped it upside down, essentially started pulling cane, sun wood up out of the way, cutting that to length and then trying to clean out all the shade wood underneath the vine. So really it was the opposite of what Nelson was doing. Nelson was pulling everything down and cutting it. We're pulling it up, and cutting the shade stuff out. Um, and you can see by this, this machine, it's a big, heavy beast with a lot of moving parts and it would crack the frame and, <laughs> and, and, you know, you'd be half the time you'd be repairing it um, with all the wheels and pulleys and everything. So what, and we're looking at the one on the middle and the left, that yellow machine, right? Yeah. What is actually, so does it have something to comb the canes upward? Yeah. Okay. So the Arkansas, if you can see my cursor. Yep. Yeah, so the Arkansas machine was all, the combs were all pulling everything down. And then with the Betts machine, we had this diamond shaped contraption in the back. And there were fingers that were pulling the canes up. So these front cutter bars kind of gave the vines a haircut. And then in the back, you had fingers pulling the sunwood up and, and the top of the diamond was cutting the canes to length. I and mean, you could adjust that in or out. Um, and then these these ones at the bottom were run up underneath the cordon trying to clean out the shade wood. Okay. Um, and so that works. So that concept, I think, is really good where you're trying to pull stuff up and cut it to length and clean out shade wood. And that really, right, the big problem with like minimal pruning is you get a lot of, you know, there's shade and dead wood and then disease sets in and you have uh, penetration problems when you're trying to spread. There's all these. So we're trying to maintain an open canopy. So again, bud quantity and bud quality. We're leaving the right number of buds and the quality of buds are the ones that were exposed to the sun. And you're trying to maintain a hand pruned type open canopy so you can get spray penetration. So that's where a bunch of these, these more simple machines have come. You got a question, Jen? Yeah, I'm sorry, Terry. And when did you start that work? Like I'm looking at your timeline here and it looks like. like yeah, the, the bets pruning. Yeah. So I came on the scene in 1998 and I think by 1999, we were working with Justin. I think that that was my baptism by fire was having <laughs> Justin Morris come up and uh, we were doing some mechanical fruit thinning at the bets farm. And, you know, we were out there collecting buckets of fruit and, <laughs> uh, and they, you know, I was young back then. They made me do all the running around the vineyard while they sat on the, at the trailer and just told me what to do. Um, so, yeah, so that was in the late nineties, early two thousands that we were running those trials. Cool. Um, so now we, We've kind of got the concept and we're building simpler, lighter, easier to use machines. So this Friday type uh, machine that came out of Michigan, which is now produced at Laporte's, 
Um, same kind of deal, just two simple cutter bars and, and the wheels with the fingers on it that are either pulling, you know, you can run those in a downward position maybe once and then turn around and run that row again and pull them up. Um, Tracy Beckman, so this was kind of a one-off thing, um, but the design is nice. And if we could find a manufacturer that would take that over. So it's a three point hitch arm that goes out. And then again, a very simple pruning mechanism where you're pulling sun canes up and, and cutting them, pulling them into this cutter bar that's adjustable for your uh, cane length that you want. What we use at the lab is a modified VMEC sprawl pruning head, which again, very simple. Uh, we have the, the finger, the wheel with the fingers that are pulling canes and we can run it, you know, we usually run it one way down a row, pulling down, kind of giving it a haircut. And then on the way back, we're pulling the sun canes up and cutting them to length. And there is a pair of uh, disc cutters in the back that we run right up underneath the cordon to clean out any of the shade wood. So again, trying to maintain an open canopy and have good bud um, quality. The biggest issue so I like that works. It's not that expensive. Well, to, I don't know what the expense is actually. <laughs> Relatively, it's not that expensive. The biggest problem is actually getting the machine. Uh, VMAX sells a tow behind trailer that has that sprawl pruning arm could be on, on two different arms that are coming out, but it takes three people to run it. So you have a tractor driver and then two people on the trailer and they sell that trailer unit um, but for our smaller vineyards around here, we really would like to have a single row unit. So the one that we have actually came from Midwest Grower Supply, which is the precursor or parent company to VMAC. And they used to build these mid tractor belly mounts, but every tractor was different. So every, you know, every arm had to be a little different. So they stopped doing that and gone right to the trailer. But if we could um, entice them to do a single row unit. I think we could sell. Um, it would, it's a good option for our growers. Right. Yeah, Terry, I would just say, you know, if you're if you're in a position where you're a little bit desperate, um, trying to get a practical unit that looks like one of these two modern ones where you're 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 really focused on cutting upwards or, or combing upwards than cutting um, this machine, you can buy the head for it and modify it a little bit. Yes but you have to figure out the tool arm on your own so they are they are right. selling the head if you don't want the trailer the issue the biggest issue with the trailer for our region is the number of acreage you can cover is just too great so it's a very fast machine you can probably cover in the neighborhood of a thousand acres with it or more um so so we just haven't scaled to the level where we need that kind of investment yet uh, even our even our biggest grower might need two pruners, but I don't think they do. So there might be one guy who needs that trailered unit, at least at the size that most of our growers are right now. So you can actually buy just the head. Um, you could theoretically get some of the local manufacturers to make a tool arm for you and a custom thing. But right now there's a labor shortage there as well. So you'd have to talk to them a lot more than you used to have to five years ago to do something like that. Um, and you'd probably be looking at 2024 crop year. So pruning in late 2023, if I had to wager a guess. Getting some of the components, the even the hydraulic flow component stuff is just getting yeah. really difficult to get on a, on a timely basis. Yep. So, and the last thing that we're doing now, this is 10 years into the future, probably. <laughs> so, but I mean, if you think about the, we've been doing vineyard mechanization work since the seventies and, and, you know, I've been involved with it since the late nineties. And so you try to stay ahead with, Hey, this is the kind of work we're going to be doing that might be implemented in 10 years from a research side. So we are continuing to work with the engineers at the robotic Institute at Carnegie Mellon university on a robotic pruner. So we just got another USDA grant to continue that work. Um, and that's really cool. It's, you know, it has a robot that they, it will automatically go up and down the rows for you. And what it does is it scans, rolls up to a vine, it'll scan it. 
it creates a 3D model of that vine, identifies where the canes go and insert into the cordons, will count the buds out. So then you could, in theory, <laughs> this is the research side, in theory, we could train that robot to say, oh, I want you to go back to a, almost a balanced pruning formula, whatever that formula is, 20 plus 20 or 30 plus 30, and say, okay, we're going to roll up to a vine. This is a three pound vine. I want to leave um, you know, 90 buds or 120 buds, and the robot would then be able to count those buds out and, and prune it for you. Um, we don't yet have it to the point where it's going to like do layers for you. <laughs> so maybe some of the vine structural maintenance will still be manual, but in terms of, in, you know, this thing could run potentially, you know, could run 24 hours a day, um, just not going up and down the rows pruning. That would certainly solve the labor issue. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there'd be a cost issue involved. I'm right. sure. <laughs> but again, if just like our mechanical harvesters that have gone up in price, if, if you have a mechanical pruner that does, you know, most of that pruning job for you and you can run it, you know, even if it runs a little slower, but you can run it 20 hours out of a 24 hour day, then it might be worth it. Yeah, I mean, it really doesn't matter how slow or fast it is as long as the price is relative to what it costs to prune and it shifts what you know it does something that our growers or all of agriculture is excellent at and has been for almost 100 years you shift your costs from labor to capital so it 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 probably won't necessarily be a cost savings thing or an increase in profitability but it will do what growers really want to do which is eliminate the the uncertainty around labor. Terry, we want to talk a little bit also about, we had the meeting, thank you so much for hosting that here of the walkthrough of the research you've been doing with the mechanical pruning. And there was a point that you had mentioned that I feel is important to share with our growers that were unable to come was that, first of all, I'll let you describe what that research trial is. And then I liked how you said in the beginning, we had different, but in the end, I'm talking yield, but I feel that you're better to say what happened. <laughs> right. Okay. So we have a, a current mechanical pruning trial going on, and, and it's all done with that VMEC sprawl pruning head that we have. And we just changed the configuration on the on the pruning head to either leave mechanical pruning with hand follow-up to leave long canes or mechanical pruning with hand follow-up to leave almost like a short spur. Um, again, we don't want a hedge where it just gets to be a rat's nest. Uh, we want to leave an open canopy, but the idea is we are, it, it's easier on the operator and it's easier on the machine to be able to just go through and, and do like a spur or a short cane pruning. Um, so we, we did this trial by hand, totally without a machine. We left on a, say on a Concord vine, we left a hundred buds. So we either left 10, 10 node canes on a vine, or we left 20, uh, what, two node spurs. So we had a hundred buds on the vines, but different configurations. So this is a little, gets a little fishy that, so we know that the base buds on a Concord cane are less fruitful. So when you leave a hundred buds of just nodes one and two, you actually end up having lower yield at first but that led to stronger vines with higher pruning weight, which then eventually you were leaving two node spurs that were more fruitful and the yield was equal to that of the cane pruned. Um, so we wanted to simulate that with the machine. So what we have in there is hand prune to long canes, machine prune to long canes, machine prune to the spurs, and machine pruning to spurs where we do some shoot positioning in the summer, but that kind of doesn't work. So we can almost throw that treatment out. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so the bottom line is after you get a couple years of that adjustment, the we're getting the same result between the long canes and the short canes with the machine pruning. So like they're running eight to 10 tons per acre. Um, the quality at that tonnage is the same. Um, between the different, and, and we're running these on whole rows, picking them um, with a yield monitor on whole rows. That's how we're comparing them. And 
Um, there's a little bit difference in the structure of the canopy, especially, and you can see that really well this time of year, where the long canes, you have shoots that are running, you know, five of the six feet of the trellis, where the spur prune stuff, all the, the shoots are up top. And where actually we have a visiting scientist, um, Anise, who's here doing some LIDAR mapping of the canopy. So we should be able to see that kind of uh, shoot density difference. But again, we're maintaining a fairly open canopy. So I don't think spray, spray penetration is going to be a problem. Um, and I know during that talk, we were um, talking about the hand follow-up. Which of those pruning techniques Basically, I had heard from Andy Joy, who was doing some of the hand follow up in that that trial that some one of the one of the treatments you just walk through and it's like, oh, snip here. Oh, snip there. Oh, snip here. Right. So the when you're doing the machine prune hand follow up for the long canes, there is a bit more of the hand follow up part because you're you know, you're trying to select those good canes. Um, still, you're making fewer cuts than you would if it was totally hand pruned. Um, with, the, with the short spur machine pruning, um, what I was noticing was that those cordons were kind of getting shorter and we were getting gaps between the vines, which I don't like, all right? You want to have a nice continuous, you know, you want shoots pretty uniformly going down that row. You don't want gaps. So what we did this last couple of years is before we prune, I have Andy go out and actually tie up canes to make sure that we get a nice continuous cordon. And then he runs through with the pruner and there's almost no hand follow up at that point. I mean, he just walks the row to get the oddball thing that's sticking out. <laughs> uh, and how so. many years have you been doing that? But you said two years, maybe two years. With yeah. That? Right. So I, I noticed the gaps and then we were like, okay, no, no, let's, cause normally we prune everything out and then we'll go back and tie it. And, and Madonna will be like every late spring, it's like, oh, we haven't gotten all the tying done yet. And I'm like, why are we doing this? Like we should just go ahead of the pruner, make sure those gaps are filled in and then just let the pruner do most of the work. And then there wouldn't be a lot of tying effort um, later on. So we're just changing up the order in which we do some stuff. And how do you find, and this might be a little premature to ask this question, but that is a concern from growers is if we do just pre prune and not hand follow up that we're going to get that inoculum and how are you going to manage those tight little, you know, look like woolly caterpillars. How are you seeing the canopy? Yeah. So I mean, we're, we have the advantage with this trial that, you know, we started from scratch and so we started by saying, we're not gonna have the rat's nest, right? We just, we're gonna run the machine and do the hand follow-ups. So you maintain that open canopy. I think a lot of the nightmare stories that we've heard about are when people were doing minimal pruning or hedge pruning and they let that rat's nest build up. And then they were like, hey, this is not working. We have to, now we have to retro um, and go back in and be real aggressive with our machine pruning and try to clean that out. And, yeah, that's where I think some of the it, bets is a great example. When we went in to start doing some mechanical pruning work in there, they they were in a hedge in some of their vineyards. It, there was a hedge and we were really aggressively going in there with the machine to try and clean things up. So, yeah. yeah, Jen, I would just say and, and, you know, I Terry already mentioned it, but if you were on the vineyard walkthrough and whether you're listening or watching today, you can't see what we're talking about. But right now, that spur prune does not look anything like a hedge. Um, and, you know, the I don't think the intent of the research is to ever allow it to. So it's just to continue to watch and see how much labor effort it takes to make sure that it doesn't. I, I think research has sort of gone beyond that minimal hedge as sort of a sustainable practice. Um, the one thing I was going to ask Terry, though, is like he definitely had the advantage of starting, this was a new planting. I'm assuming that's why he had that issue with cordons because he was training spurs to be cordons. Um, I don't know if he has any thoughts about how this might look or work. Would that step be necessary if you were training or if you were starting from hand pruned vines? 
Yeah, I'm trying to remember the year we planted it. It was like 2012 or 2013. I mean, so we went through a standard vineyard establishment. Okay. All, you know, everything was by hand and we got the cordons wrapped out and then we started with uh, different mechanical pruning treatments. Um, and that's when I, yeah, we had the cordons wrapped out and they immediately kind of got cut back. And that's when I'm like, no, no, we can't, we need to keep that trellis filled out. Okay. Um, yeah. So I think it was more of a, I think it was more of an effect of this is how we've always done it. So we're going to do it again this way. And then wait a minute. No, we're, our actual treatment is different. So maybe we have to change our practices. Um, to, to maintain the viticulture concept of having a 100% canopy fill going down the row. Right, okay. So I'm trying, I'm sitting here with my brain swirling about, okay, how do we <laughs> convince growers that this is a practice that they could implement to help offset the labor issue? And where does that leap come from, Kevin? I'm looking. I'm looking at both of you actually for your suggestions. So Terry, in your experience, and I know a lot of people will come back and say, "Yes, but you're a research station. This isn't real life commercial grape growing," which we are, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so this model, I think, is most appropriate where, or you know, the easiest way to convince a grower is to say, "Hey, look, here's another option, and it's the only option you have left." <laughs> right there's no other option um what we're seeing right now with the current labor shortage is that it is practical to hire hand pruners uh, to come in that have experience in doing hand pruning you know your traditional migrant workers and pay them 35 to 40 cents a vine to follow a pruner around and unlike real hand pruning they're in the range of 75 to 90 or 100 vines per hour so they're making 30 to $40 per hour. This is a great re recruiting tool when it you know for a fact that you are not going to be able to prune or finish pruning before the start of the growing season. It works really well. So two things could happen. You could get to a point where you could say, I can't afford $40 an hour. Not only am I paying the exact same that I was in 2017 for pruning, I'm also running a fairly expensive machine through the vineyard and maybe even paying somebody to do that. I can't do both. Um, right now, we can definitely afford to do both. The grape prices are fine. An extra $40 an acre or $50 an acre is not a big deal. We can afford to do it. Nobody's going to go bankrupt over that. Um, there will be pressure to make that process more efficient when grape prices fall. There could also be pressure to make that process more efficient or to find other supplies of labor if we continue to see a decline in labor. So I don't think you're going to see um, local labor sources that are not migrants do that kind of hand follow up in a sustainable way, because if you don't have that experience and training, you're not going to be able to make that many cuts and make $40 an hour. So it's not gonna be anywhere near as appealing. I don't know what you're gonna make per hour. I'd probably make somewhere close to minimum wage uh, if it were me. <laughs> so it's not an appealing job for me to do. And so that's what you run into. Now you get into this spur pruning method and at least it's how it seems how fast we're going right now. You can have local labor do that job. They can probably do something else while they do it. So they don't necessarily have to walk a 15 minute mile and make their, I don't know, whatever it is, three, 400 cuts per acre or less, they could check posts or put in staples or clips if it's a metal post. Um, so they're, so then you're not even being charged for the actual time that it takes to walk because you were going to make that walk anyway. So then you, you start to save a couple hundred dollars per acre. Did you but, hear that savings of a couple hundred dollars per acre? <laughs> but it's a very different practice. I think there's still some unknowns about what this looks like five or 10 years down the road. So I don't know that that even a couple hundred dollars an acre in savings is enough to convince the industry to adopt it um, until they need to. So we'll see. I mean, we're certainly going to do things like this and demonstrations and share the information. And I think you'll see some growers start to adopt some or all of these practices, but probably widespread adoption will have something to do with with real economics. 
Well, I truly appreciate that this is already going on. And that's the sense of research. You're always trying. Yeah, to I think, I think, yeah, from the research side of things, it's all about the, the quantity and quality of buds that you leave. And it's just been the iterations that we've got. I mean, Nelson Chala said, leave no more than 60 buds and need, need to be the best buds. It had a really difficult time doing that with the machine. Bob Poole said, leave all the buds and control your crop with thinning. And we found out that that didn't work. <laughs> um, and so we've just gone through these different iterations of the machine to say, oh, we want to make the machine simple, but it also has to leave the right quantity of buds and then the quality, the sun exposed buds. And so I think research has done that part. Like we've given you the option, here's the machine, it works. And when you get into trouble where you don't have labor or labor is too expensive, this research has already got the solution for you. Now I think we just have an issue of getting access to the machines <laughs> is probably the biggest problem I see right now. Yeah. And I think that's, I think it's entirely possible to get a machine. If you really want a machine, you, you can't necessarily get it when you want it or how you want to get it. Um, so this model does not fit well into like a, Hey, I can't find my pruning crew and it's January. What can I do? Um, maybe it will five years down the road. It probably won't though, because things might get a little bit better in this whole supply chain thing, but we've always had this issue in vineyards and vineyard um, equipment in that we don't have, we're not huge. We're not, you know, we're not Iowa. So this is going to be uh, equipment that's specifically designed for vineyards. So, so inherently uh, the market's always going to be small unless we're purchasing something that's identical to another industry or identical to what California is doing. And that's probably not where this path is going to go. Our equipment's going to be a little bit different. So it's just going to take a little longer to get um, that machine. We have you, you could get that machine in two years, but it would not be like walking into a dealership, buying it and waiting. You would be, calling people, trying to figure out where to get it, and then trying to negotiate somebody to build a tool arm for you that has some fabrication ability or doing it yourself. So it's totally possible. It's just not as simple as as buying an iPhone by any stretch. <laughs> well, we're gonna actually, Terry, you've done a blog on this with video showing it in action, correct? Yes, so you, yeah, so you just, we're just going to splice it in just here. splice it in at the end of this conversation. Yeah. And it's just, it really just covers all the stuff we've already talked about, but, but shows the video to kind of drive it home for the our growers. And if you missed the walkthrough that we did with Terry and his team last week, it was requested during that walkthrough that we actually see it in action doing the pruning. So we're going to try to set up another meeting that you can actually watch it as what we were talking, maybe November, I think the end of November, maybe December. Depends on when the leaves come off. Yeah. Right. Watching, <laughs> watching the pre pruner, pre pruner in action. Well, we'll also have a summer growers conference. I'm assuming we'll make our way down there when we're at Clarell for that right. summer growers conference. Yeah. So you'll see what that canopy structure looks like once it's full or close to full. Yep. Is there All anything right. you want to add about it before we sign off? I mean, I know there's a lot of great work going on. I just want to make sure we were able to touch all points. You didn't talk about the metal posts. <laughs> oh, yeah. Maybe we so, should. Maybe yeah, we should. which is, is <laughs> yes. So we have, so we have those pruning treatments in there, but we split the block. So half of the treatments are done on a metal post at every vine. So a metal T post, not the rolled steel that everyone worries about um, metal T posts versus wood posts at every third vine, like the traditional setup. So when, if people come to the field day, they'll be able to see that as well. And um, the whole idea there is, can we make it easier on the machine operator by having a metal post at every vine and keeping that trellis really straight uh, versus if you have a wood post every third vine after so many years that that wire starts to sag and and as an operator you're trying to follow that wire or have to come up with a sled or something that follows the wire or a sensor um, to have that done so just 
So I know people uh, have very strong feelings about metal versus wood. <laughs> they do. They do. They do. Um, what what I would say is is those strong feelings. What surprised me in that walkthrough is those strong feelings actually go in both directions. Uh, there were a lot of strong feelings about C posts for a long time because they were widely used and not very effective in our climate with our vineyard structure. You know, if you're growing an acre, a ton to the acre on Pinot Noir, they're probably plenty strong enough. But you start putting them in Concord vineyards or even some of our hybrids, they're they're just not suitable. This is not what those posts are, and they are also a little bit more expensive than those posts. Um, they're but really what it comes down to is when terry decided to establish this vineyard i think he did it because it looks just way more suitable for mechanization and we know that labor is a problem and finding skilled labor is a problem and it lowers the amount of skill that's required and or it increases the speed that a, that a, a mechanized piece of equipment can travel and i think he saw how it worked in california and how they were able to to realize that efficiency there and he brought it here and at the time, with our growers being as focused as they are on whatever is the least cost method, um, there's a there was a huge upfront capital cost to establishing a vineyard that way. Um, but a lot of things have changed since then. So the price of a, a metal T-post that we use, I think they're nine foot T-post. Is that right, Terry? Maybe you remember, maybe you don't. Um, has gone from around 625 per post to 675. Uh, not a lot of our growers might be familiar with what the prices of those posts are or uh, how much they cost, but this is this is how much they cost when you buy them the way uh, Claro bought them in bulk, sort of by a truckload. Um, they can be twelve or fifteen dollars a post if you you know if you run to Home Depot or even your local farm supply and just buy a small bundle. So that's not how much they actually cost if they're if you're using them in vineyards. We know that that. Um, great posts are somewhere between nine and twelve dollars a post. So we know that they've effectively doubled over the last couple of years. Uh, the one thing that concerns me, we've seen the price of lumber bouncing around like crazy, but we really think that the what is driving the price of these posts is trucking. So I think you will see some price in um, in in you know you will see the price of two by fours come down. But I'm not sure you will see that in grape posts because of the amount of trucking. They are trucked to to get harvested. They are trucked to get processed. Then they are trucked to get treated. Then they're trucked to a distribution center. Then they're trucked to our area. So that's really what's driving this increase in cost. And what it translates to is um, we know that it would cost around $4,300 per acre to establish metal posts at every vine. That's what I was going to hope you. Somebody would say every vine. <laughs> um, we also know that if you wanted to, you could do it. You could probably do it at every other vine. You would then likely have a similar setup to wood posts. It would be as strong or stronger than wood posts, but you you could have a little bit of imperfection in the wire, and you certainly wouldn't have the benefit of being able to train to a post. Um, obviously, that would be uh, thirty percent cheaper in terms of establishment costs, but but your ground speed and your training method would be identical. So you wouldn't realize any savings there. Now, when we go back to wood posts and we compare wood posts at every third vine, uh, you're looking at around $2,500 per acre. Um, so that difference of $1,840 per acre, is that expensive or is it not? And really what it boils down to is how long you expect these posts to last. So if you have in your mind that metal posts are garbage and C posts are terrible and they last 10 or 12 years, it's not going to make any sense. A lot of people that have experience with T posts think they're going to last 30 to 35 years. I don't know if they're right. I know our crew thinks after seven years, ours look very, very new and they're very happy with how long they last. They're very happy with the decrease in maintenance. Um, we know pretty well that that modern treated posts are going to last 20, 20 years. So if metal posts last 35 years and um, and the the wood posts last 20 years, the cost per year uh, to have those posts is one hundred and twenty five dollars an acre for metal and one hundred and twenty seven for wood. And then you don't have to replace. Them. 
So I don't know. I don't know if they're going to last that long. And I don't know if you care that they last that long. It might depend on how old you are. <laughs> but what even just the having, and I'm, I'm not advocating for one or the other, I'm just noting that in these metal posts where you train the vine to the post, they are straight. It is ease of walking through. When I see some of the older vineyards with wooden posts and three vines per panel and the dog legs that are out there to catch them when you're going through, I don't know. One or the other, there's. So I guess what I would say, if you know, if you don't care about that, if you want your vines to be crooked, then the least cost method right now is two metal posts. Uh, it's going to be significantly less expensive than wood. Your establishment cost is going to be slightly more, but your maintenance cost is going to dramatically decrease. Because the other thing that happens is, uh, and this is assuming we think that they're going to last, but the other thing that happens is we know whether they last 20, 25, or 30 years, we know that they all break close to the same time. So with wood posts, if they last 20 years, they last 20 years because some of them last seven and some of them last 40. So we have annual maintenance after about four or five years. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's that's a very big cost that, that essentially almost gets eliminated. So you're still doing trellis maintenance, but you're not walking through and checking every post anymore. So how would you anticipate somebody switching over or at least trying to start the progress of going to a metal post? Could you do it? Do you have yeah. to do whole rows at a time or could you do? Well, so it depends on what your goal is, right? Like if you don't care about crooked vines, probably the thing that makes most sense is every time you get a broken wooden post, you put in three or four metal posts. And that's probably the least cost method of doing it. The other thing you could do is when you're replacing wire, you could pull out all the all the wood posts and replace metal and that would be a really convenient time to do it you tend to do a lot of renewal work at that time anyway because your cordons are coming off or and some people even cut off at the ground so you're going to have an opportunity to train up a lot of new trunks anyway that could be straight uh, you know maybe mechanization is so important to you that you are ex you are doing this exclusively so you do five acres a year where you switch to metal and you switch to every vine. I don't think it makes sense to switch to metal um, all at once if you're doing every two, but if you are doing every three, I could see some growers, if they start to realize savings and mechanization, doing that um, at sort of five acres at a time and either salvaging or scrapping the wood posts that were in good condition. And, and you know, maybe moving them to vineyards that they're not gonna mechanize or, or selling them. Um, Either way, I guess is what I would say. So so I, I would see those would be two practical ways that this could become established, you know, which is always something that's important to think about because what Terry did is he established a new vineyard. And we know sometimes some of these practices really rely from a business perspective on establishing a new vineyard. And I don't think that's true in this case. I think I think there's two different ways to go about it, and it just depends on what your goals are. And eventually you would have straight vines if you if you establish them at every vine, even if you were doing it incrementally. So just to go back and talk you know, why all of this is important, we are having labor issues. We have the research that supports that this is an option for you. And if you have more information or want more information or have questions about it, please reach out to us and we can either help you get started or point you in the right direction. Absolutely. Uh, thank you all for joining us. This was Between the Vines for the Lake Erie Regional Grape Program at Claro. And thank you, Terry, for joining us. It's yeah, always good to have you thanks on. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And Stay thank you. to listen to the blog that's going to be attached <laughs> to the end of this. <laughs> Terry won't be back next week, I doubt, but uh, he's got a lot of research to do. But uh, certainly I will be here with Jen and we'll be here to address what's going on in the vineyard. Uh, actually, before we go, since this is kind of the growing season and a current update, did anything happened this week phenology it did happen yesterday terry would you like to make it yeah. <laughs> you can make the you can make the call <laughs> <laughs> terry and his team in our phenology block here at the claro research station called bloom in concord yesterday officially called it on june 8th 2022 yep so one day earlier than terry predicted i think two or three days earlier than the original very early prediction from the lake model 
and six days earlier than average. So it should hopefully be smooth sailing for the rest of the year. Right? So Terry, but, it's six days earlier. How many right? three, three days per ton. So <laughs> so six days early, you should be able to ripen two extra tons than what you normally can ripen. But it's yeah. yet to be seen if you we are we're actually going to set two tons more than um, after last year's big crop. So. And you have a model for that as well, right? Yep. So, Ver. so we don't think we're going to get two extra tons. Oh, of so the our model right now says, based on last year's crop load, that you're going to have 30% less yield than what you had last year. Not what you have, not from average. It's just 30%. Like if you had whatever, 10 tons per acre last year, 30% less means you would have seven tons this year. All right. Based on science. So Terry, based on we, crop load, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Terry, just for the people listening, that is what we're doing for our bloom date here. And that is important because you need to do crop estimation, which is 30 days post bloom. So you need to go out into your vineyards and see when 50% of your clusters are in bloom to call bloom at your own vineyard. But usually we give you a little bit of this time. We talk about here because that's where all of our research is done but we want you to go out and know when your bloom date is. So that's 50% of the clusters in your canopy are in bloom. Yes? Yes. Uh, just one question on that model though. You said 30% less than last year. That's kind of an industry-wide model, right? Like the grower who had 22 tons per acre shouldn't have 15 this oh. year. <laughs> <laughs> but the, grower, the growers that we saw yesterday in Northeast that had some frost damage and they only had eight tons per acre might actually have more so yes so that is based on that's based on last year's crop load so what the crop load was in your vineyard will uh impact the change in pruning weight which impacts the change in what your yield potential is so yes we're, those are averages that we're talking so last year on average our crop load was like at 25 balance is 15 we were at like 25 so we were slightly overcropped which le yields to it leads to a reduction in pruning weight on average and a reduction in yield potential on average right. uh, but again it, like it's good it just like Jen is saying to know when bloom is in your vineyard, like it's really be awesome if you could calculate crop load in your own vineyard, which is the yield to pruning weight ratio. So what is what was your average yield last year? What was your average pruning weight over the winter if you took it? And um, you calculate that Revaz index. And then we have a model from there to tell you what your yield potential should be this year. All right. It really is on my radar to get that pushed out and to get more people trying it. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Jen. All right. So we will actually see you next week. We're going to end here now. Uh, but but yeah, thank you both and thank everybody for taking the time. This was supposed to be short. It was, it was supposed, supposed to be. be. <laughs> All right. Bye. 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 Cornell research on mechanical pruning of Concord grapevines in New York has been going on since the 1970s as a way to reduce our dependency on vineyard labor while maintaining or even improving overall vineyard productivity and fruit quality. I'm Dr. Terry Bates and today's podcast will discuss our current approach to mechanically pruning Concord grapevines. So here's a Concord vineyard block at our lab and we are faced with pruning these vines either manually or mechanically with the goal of retaining both the proper fruiting bud quantity or number and bud quality or fruitfulness for our production system. Most Concord in our region are grown on a single high wire bilateral cordon training system where the growing shoots are allowed to sprawl during the season. We know that the canes at the top of the canopy with well sun exposed leaves tend to have fruiting buds with higher potential fruitfulness than ones buried deep inside the shade of the canopy. So one goal during pruning is to retain those sun exposed canes and buds at the top of the canopy. We also know that bud fruitfulness changes in Concord as you go down the length of the cane. Bud positions one and two tend to be less fruitful than three through seven. That is why longer cane pruning is preferred in Concord and Niagara over short spur pruning, which can be done with some vinifera varieties with fruitful base buds. 
achieving this type of longer cane pruning, again with the goal of good retained node quantity and quality, with a machine has been challenging. Shawless and Shepherdson at Cornell started working with Concord mechanized pruning in the early 1970s, a combination of downward shoe positioning during the growing season and the so-called lower 180 degree pruning seen here were used to retain the most fruitful buds for the next growing season. While this system showed some promise in labor savings, Shawless described the critical need for complementary viticulture management to ensure proper bud number and quality. In the 1980s, mechanical hedging and minimal pruning were introduced through variable sized box pruning. This method removed the idea of bud selection by leaving most or all of the buds and letting the vines set a large crop. To avoid overcropping, mid-season mechanical fruit thinning could be used, and the method for doing this was first tested by Bob Poole. Hedging Concord in Geneva Double Curtain Train Vineyard was also successful, uh, used by making a tight inside cut with the fruiting buds retained to the outside of the canopy. These systems also showed promise, but it was critical to adopt other crop control methods such as shoot thinning or fruit thinning to keep the crop in balance with the vine growth. In the 1990s, Morris and Oldridge from Arkansas developed their systems approach to vineyard mechanization, where multiple mechanized operations such as pruning, shoot thinning, or shoot positioning would be used throughout the season to achieve vineyard balance. For Concord production, the Morris Oldridge mechanical pruner worked off of Shawless's lower 180 pruning, where a configuration of combs and cutter bars would pull canes down and away from the cordon to leave longer fruiting wood. Using the Morris Oldrich machine as a base, Bob Betts, Tom Davenport, and myself reconfigured the machine to pull up and retain sun-exposed canes while cleaning out shade wood below the cordon. In comparison to the previous methods, I guess we would consider this an upper 180 degree pruning. Other pruners take in similar concept of pulling sun-exposed canes up and cutting them to length, but with much less weight on the tractor or fatigue for the operator. Another type of mechanical pruner used in New York Concord production has been the Friday type pruner developed in Michigan. There are other commercially available pruners with the same concept of pulling and positioning canes into adjustable cutter bars. The VMEC, VMEC sprawl pruner available through Midwest Grower Supply uses similar vertical cutter bars but has rotary disc cutters above and below the cordon to shape the pruning box. This season, Andy Joy and Dan Sprague at Clarell did a mashup of systems to include the cane pullers with vertical cutter bars to select and cut sun-exposed canes and maintain the rotary cutters to clean out shade wood. At this point, all the components are adjustable and we are testing out different configurations to find out what works best in our management program. The system does a good job selecting sun-exposed canes, so good bud quality, a less aggressive approach retains high bud number, which gives us additional options for crop control, such as manual pruning follow-up, as well as shoot or fruit thinning later in the season. A more aggressive pruning approach can greatly reduce the node quantity if that is what is desired. If you want to know more about the mechanical pruning of Concord grapevines or want to see any of our machine prune plots compared to hand pruned vines, contact the Lake Erie Regional Grape Program and stop on by for a visit. Podcasting for Cornell Agritech and the Lake Erie Regional Grape Program, this has been Terry Bates of the Cornell Lake Erie Research and Extension Lab.